Hello, everyone. It's uh, Dan Sandink from the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Uh, thanks very much for joining us uh, for the third ICLR Friday Forum of the Year. Um, today, we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Julian Brimlow, who will be uh, talking to us about uh, hail, uh, various aspects of hail observation, climate change, and, and other uh, interesting topics for this uh, very important peril for insurers and residents and uh, agricultural community across Canada. Uh, so uh, Dr. Julian Brimelow is a scientist at Environment Climate Change Canada. He's an expert in hazardous convective weather. Uh, he uh, completed his MSc and PhD at the University of Alberta and University of Manitoba respectively. And he's published uh, widely on deep convection, thunderstorms, hail, flood, and drought. And he's had some in interesting uh, assignments in the past um, with, uh, for example, the British Antarctic Survey and the South African uh, Weather Service. Uh, so he should uh, provide us some very interesting information and we're looking forward to his presentation. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to remind people who are uh, new to our webinars, um, looks like we have a pretty good crowd, over, over 50 people on the line. Uh, so for those of you who are new, uh, we uh, typically collect the questions throughout the webinar, uh, and you can use the question function within the webinar uh, uh, pane there uh, to, to uh, submit your questions. And then at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll have a, a discussion with uh, Dr. Bermelo. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it to, to Dr. Bermelo. Uh, thanks very much, Dan. Uh, can everybody hear me that out there? Uh, I can okay. certainly hear you. Okay, good. Um, well, thanks very much for joining us today, and I, I hope you enjoy this talk. Uh, I've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm just going to dive right in here. And um, this is actually mostly based on a talk I gave in Boulder, um, Colorado last August, uh, but I have added some additional material. So on the first slide here, I think this exemplifies the problem we face with hail um, worldwide um, in that in this top left image here, the animation, this is a computer generated uh, image by the uh, convection allowing model called Cloud Model 1, and it's by Leif Orff. Um, and it's actually very beguiling because if you look very carefully on the bottom right hand side of that storm, you can actually see a small tornado. And that's just been spun up by physics, pure physics. Um, and on the bottom left, we have a actual uh, animation of a real tornado, tornadic storm. And I think we can agree they both look really good. They look very comparable. The problem is, is to generate that tornado, um, we can't, there's a sacrifice you have to make, and that is you can't delve into the microphysics very deeply. And that prevents us from modeling explicitly uh, hailstones like you see on the bottom right here, which is the Vivian hailstone, which is the current record holder uh, for observed hailstones in uh, North America. And so based on all of that and all my experience to date, I'm compelled to say that observing and forecasting hail is as difficult, if not more difficult, than is forecasting tornadoes. And uh, I might, some might find it a little controversial, but I think, and I hope after uh, listening to this talk, uh, that you'll, you'll agree with me on that. So before I get into all the, the nitty gritty science, I thought I'd do something a little fun. Uh, this image here is the Vivian Hailstone that I just spoke about. Uh, it fell in 2010 in the, on the Northern Great Plains, and it's a pretty hefty stone, as you can see. And uh, I was doing some research, and unbeknownst to me, uh, there was this photo on the internet of another hailstone that fell the same year in uh, Wichita, Kansas. Now, uh, the one on the bottom left is arguably larger than the Vivian stone. Unfortunately, all we have as evidence of that stone is the divot it left in the ground. But after some careful scale analysis, I managed to generate this map. So this is just a composite of the largest stones that we know of in North America. Sorry, this is very North American centric. Um, and the uh, coffee bowl stone, which was, you know, the one we know most about uh, that fell in 1970, it just, you know, pales in comparison to some of these others. And, and the Potter stone from way back in 1928. Um, but the stones that fell in Wichita that day, the, the one stone did get weighed and it came in at about 500 grams, which is far less than the Vivian stone. Um, but the, the, 
third stone on the bottom right, if you superimpose Vivian on there, um, I think it's, it's hard to argue that that Wichita three stone it, it was probably uh, much heavier and larger than the Vivian stone. Um, and, and this kind of speaks to the problem we face with hail. It, it is infrequent. Um, it falls, you know, here and there. It, it, you don't get very contiguous areas of hail fall or large areas of hail fall. So how big is the biggest hail that falls? I, we don't really know for sure. We can make some back of the envelope calculations or some model runs. And some colleagues and I seem to be leaning towards the one and a half kilogram um, area, which is, as you can see, about twice as much as the Vivian stone. Um, so I'm pretty sure there's much larger hail out there. It's just that it probably hasn't been observed to date. And um, just a preamble, just a little hint of what's to come. You'll see a lot of these stones are very irregular in shape. So measuring them can lead to rather misleading results. And uh, that's why for the radical stones, we tend to focus on the mass of the stone um, because that's a far more reliable indicator of the, you know, the, the energy associated with that stone when it falls and its uh, ability to cause damage. So that just sets the scene here for hail. It can get really big, uh, much bigger than some of us might think. So some background, um, hail science is difficult and there are a lot of challenges. That, that's me when I'm trying to think of uh, how big the hail's gonna get on a given day or if somebody asks me, it's not an easy question to answer. And the reason is, is that the size of hail on the ground is determined by a myriad of processes and they occur across a wide range of spatial temporal scales, everything from the microphysics to dynamical scale and even synoptic scale. And it's complicated by the fact that we don't have a complete understanding of the microphysics involved in hail growth, uh, the storm scale processes at work, and the connections between the storm scale environment and these storm processes. Uh, this image on the right-hand side here is the, uh, from the scientific literature and different relationships that have been used for the collection of ice crystals by hail in the dry growth regime. That's when its surface is mostly dry. It's not covered in a, a wet film of water. As, as you can see, there's a lot of difference there. And, you know, we don't, which, cur which of those curves is right, I, I couldn't honestly tell you. Um, and, and this is a problem that we face, um, despite a lot of science being done. There's still a lot of unknowns. And hail size is not unique to a given environment. Uh, and that also makes things very difficult, because if you have the same, this graph here shows the mixed level cape um, compared to the, uh, zero to six kilometer bulk wind difference. And typically as the bulk wind difference increases and the buoyancy or the cape increases, the probability or the likelihood of large hail increases. But you can see in this area here, uh, in your intermediate sizes of hail, there's a lot of overlap. But those storms all occurred in very similar environments. And that makes it challenging to predict hail size. And this is perhaps one of the biggest issues that we face in hail research is the lack of reliable observations. Um, as you, a lot of you will know, uh, Canada's observation network has been significantly impacted by reductions um, to the point where a lot of people are now having to terminate their research around the mid 2000s, around 2006, 2007, just because following that fact, that, that date, we, we don't have re reliable data anymore. And I think Dave Etkin, in a recent report for ICLR demonstrated that very nicely with the histogram. And uh, there's also been a lack of coordination and collaboration with most of researchers, uh, until recently at least, working largely in parallel. And just to speak also to the problems that we're facing uh, with hail, I mean, obviously for, for insurers and, and uh, even farmers and the such, uh, knowing a hail climatology would be very valuable. We, ha we have lightning climatologies, we have temperature precipitation climatologies, um, even fairly reliable tornado climatologies, depending where you are. But it's been a real struggle to try and get a climatology of hail, um, not only regionally, but globally. And uh, different approaches have been used. Uh, Emroz uh, et al. in 2017 used the GPM mission satellite data, uh, the dual frequency precipitation radar on board that platform. And they came up with the top left image of a uh, global hail occurrence. Um, but you'll see there's some hot spots over the tropics that a lot of us are rather skeptical about. 
um, seems to capture uh, the you know uh, here, uh, tornado alley over the southern U.S. plains pretty well. Um, but there are other areas where we're not very comfortable with the results. Um, recently, Prime and Holland uh, used atmospheric variables from reanalysis and an algorithm that they developed to uh, estimate the occurrence of hail around the planet. And at first glance, it looks pretty good. There are some anomalous areas uh, or that, you know, that you might question. Uh, and, but you'll notice, for example, thinking of Canada, that this image here doesn't capture Hail Alley between Edmondson and uh, to just south of Calgary. Uh, John Allen and Lepore are currently working on a, a paper for North America, in which they use the North American reanalysis, which is a high resolution reanalysis product. And they use, build on some previous research in which they estimate the hail size one can expect for a given return period. And uh, you can see there that there's this, this real hot spot over the, the central plains, uh, which is very close to where the Vivian and the Coffeeville stones and the Aurora Hill stones fell, uh, including Potter as well and the Wichita stones. So even using these techniques, which are not ideal because they're really proxies, right? They're not an, a, a direct measurement. Um, they, they do give us some indication of the areas of biggest hail threat but there's still a lot of uncertainties uh, associated with these data, and it's a work in progress. So it's not all bad though. In recent years and decades, there have been incredible advances in computing power and the availability of remote sensing data. We have very powerful supercomputers now. We can now run convection allowing models and 3D cloud models using multi-moment microphysics schemes. And uh, with the, the development of dual polarization radar and uh, it becoming more common, uh, we are now uh, better able to detect uh, hail in storms and we can now even maybe in get a hint of the size of the hail in storms using some very advanced processing techniques uh, for dual polarization radar. And we've also had the emotion of uh, technology such as laser scanners and 3D printers and the miniaturization of sensors. This is a, an IMU. Uh, units on the right hand side here and this can measure the uh, different motions uh, say if you to place this in a hailstone and drop it, it it can measure how that stone was rotating uh, and its other moments of movement and these are now very small and small enough that we can do some research with them on the same scale as as the actual hailstones and uh, IBHS in the United States has done some great work Ian Germanko and his colleagues in collecting stones and scanning them and then you get these really neat images of stones and uh, these have actually been used to conduct research and obviously social media is now an important data source uh, the question is is how reliable it is and that's the major challenge facing social media but it is something that we can now try and use for our research and i'll speak to that more later so the big question is how do we leverage all these late recent developments uh, that we now have at our disposal? So I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail. I'm just gonna build this graphic here, but I've identified, identified about four major pillars of areas where there are still important gaps in our knowledge. And I've also been thinking about some ways that we can address the, those gaps. So the one is observations, the other is microphysics, uh, the other is experiments and in-situ data. And the final one is the identification discrimination of, of hail. And these all feed into improved forecasts, now casts and alerts, as well as risk mitigation and assessment. And then all of those fall on the umbrella of coordination and collaboration to try and fill some of these gaps. So the first gap is observations. And as I mentioned earlier, hail data sets have significant limitations, in part because of the high spatiotemporal variability of hail swaths, but there are also other issues. So there we have a nice picture of a hail swath near Calgary taken by a, a pilot a few years ago. So as I mentioned earlier, we have sparse observation networks, and we have also observation networks that are in decline, making the, the data even more sparse. Uh, we have significant population and measurement biases. Um, obviously, if there's no one there to observe the hill, it's going to be uh, not recorded. And uh, when I speak to measurement biases, this picture here is somebody holding hail in their hand. It's probably one of the biggest challenges I face in my research. 
if I had a dollar for every photo like this I saw, I'd actually be doing quite well. Um, unfortunately, this particular photo would not be of much use to my particular area of research because people's hands come in many different sizes. And then we also have interesting hail like this, where it's got these very uh, pronounced lobes on it. And measuring a hailstone like that is, is obviously going to be very difficult. <clears throat> and the other interesting thing about people when they measure hail, and I've noticed this in the Canadian data, it's been noticed in the American data, the Storm Prediction Center data, is that people tend to have a propensity to report golf ball hail. And you can see that with this red bar here. That, that, though, that histogram should be following an exponential distribution. Um, but it seems to be human nature, and we're not too, quite sure why this is happening. And there is some research going on in, into why this might be, because uh, there's a social aspect to this, so social science, is uh, you know we have this anomaly, and, and that is something you really have to keep in mind when you're doing research. And then we also have timing and location errors. Um, people might try and remember when the hail fell. They might give you, you know, say it fell in Calgary. Well, Calgary is a big city or, or Toronto. Um, so uh, those displacement areas uh, can be problematic. And there's also in the confusion in how we report hail. Do we uh, measure its circumference? Do we measure its radius or the, the, the longest axis? Or, um, and that is not always documented, which can complicate things. And people tend to focus on reporting only the large hail sizes. And um, ideally, we'd have a hail size distribution. And the other problem is that the, when the person reported the hail, was that the time when the storm was at its most intense? So does it reflect the true storm severity? And going back to data networks, uh, we have a lack of long-term data sets for climate studies. And this is obviously a big problem. So some solutions. Um, we do have some diverse but complementary tools available. Uh, we have social media and reporting apps um, that people are become, starting to use quite a bit now. And if you remember that earlier graph with the, the uh, spurious uh, golf ball uh, data point, if you use social media hail sizes, you get a much more realistic distribution of hail sizes, which is very encouraging. And these are from photographs where I scaled the hail size using an object, a reference object. So that, that is encouraging. Uh, but we have to do a lot of education and public outreach to make those social media reports uh, useful. And I'll get to that in a bit in a while here. So this is a graphic that a colleague and I at Environment Climate Change Canada are working out that we're hoping to tweet out soon uh, before the summer season starts, you know, just to give some people uh, some ideas uh, on how to report hail in a way that is useful, not only to forecasters who are issuing warnings, but also to the research community. And uh, an idea I've come up with that I'm gonna to speak to later as well is to weigh the hailstones instead of focusing on size. Um, that, that has a lot of benefits in doing that. And you can just get a fairly accurate estimate of the hail size using some basic physics. And there have been some uh, field studies uh, Hailstone, Shave, uh, IBHS, Chat, and Kokoras uh, to collect hail, but we really need more of those and uh, longer lived projects. And then we need to maintain and expand existing hail networks. Uh, in Europe, they have some very good hail pad data networks, uh, especially in France and Spain, and they go back decades. They got decades worth of data from these hail pad networks, and I don't think we really have anything. Uh, in North America, um, other than the Kokoros uh, Volunteer Hail Pad Network. And uh, we can install networks of impact astrometers. Um, the technology is now at the point that it's relatively cost effective and uh, th they have low power requirements and they can be um, put out in the field and actually measure hail. And they can even be used, deliver the data in real time to uh, alert forecasters and other stakeholders that, that hail's on the way. Or go back and do some studies on, on the event after the fact. This is a, a sensor that's been developed in Europe. And then we can also use remote sensing data to identify hail swaths and identify and es estimate the maximum hail size. So we can, we can use high resolution uh, satellite imagery um, to, to identify hail swaths, for example. So just to go back to leveraging social media, 
Um, the question I asked myself a couple of years ago is, uh, could images of hail be, that are posted on social media provide a source of objective and accurate hail size measurements? So the only way to really test that hypothesis is to try and do it. So uh, data I'm showing you today is for data I collected from Twitter between 2014 and 2016. I've since extended that to 2018. So we'll have about five years of, of data. And uh, basically what I did is I went through a bunch of uh, hashtags on, on Twitter uh, where people tend to post photographs of uh, hail. And I sorted the images into four categories, you know, images of damage. Uh, what I call the scene is, and there's a lot of these photographs where people just took something looking out a window, um, a photograph with hail, but there's no object in it that I can use to scale the size of the hail and then scalable uh, photographs. And to date I have about, I'd say over 3000 photographs that I've managed to collect. Now, what I did was to estimate the size of the hail, I calculated what we call the equivalent spherical diameter of the larger stones in the photographs. And the diameter is important because the kinetic energy or its ability to inflict damage scales with the diameter to the power of four. So a small increase in diameter has a disproportionate increase in damage potential. So it's really, that's one of the reasons we focus on, um, on the diameter. So using scaling and assuming the stones are spheroids, um, typically they're actually triaxial ellipsoids. So there's three axes, not two. Um, one can estimate the equivalent spherical diameter of the, of the hail. So this, if it's triaxial ellipsoid, this technique will actually overestimate the hail size a little bit but it can still give you a very good estimate of the hail size. So just some information about the statistics that I gathered back in um, th th those uh, three years that I had looked at. Um, and here's just 2016. You'll notice that a lot of people tend to report, report hail from their home or cabin, um, which is a bit of a surprise to me. Um, uh, I thought there'd be a lot more data from people away from home on the road, you know, for example, uh, storm chasers, but that's not the case. And in terms of the photographs, you'll see about 80% of the images were not usable, at least for my type of research. And that's a problem, and that is really just a result of uh, the public not knowing how to properly report hail. And I think that is something that we do have some control over and that we can address. So I'm not going to speak to all of these, but uh, during the course of the research, I identified many problems with trying to use photos from social media. Some of them were obvious, others were less obvious. For example, if someone uses a nickel and a dime, but they, don't, they use the wrong side, example, uh, the head side, I don't know if that's a nickel or a dime. So any scale up, scaling I do using that coin or that picture is going to be inaccurate. So Suffice to say, there are a lot of issues. So this is where I came with the idea of an alternative approach. Um, as I mentioned, you know, hail is fiddly and difficult. I've tried to do it myself. I, I do do it quite a lot when I'm out chasing. Um, the stones are wet. There's, there's lightning around or rain. Uh, you pushed for time. You're in ditches next to the side of the road. Uh, the hail's melting in your hand. So even, you know, just to get a, a simple measurement is very difficult. And I think it's because of that, that a lot of people just tend to hold hail in their hands, uh, which is pretty and um, informative on one level, but quantitatively, it's not helpful. And even if you do get um, a picture like the one on the right there with a, a loon in it, and it's like, okay, this is great. Uh, I can get a pretty good estimate of these stones to size, but then you notice they've got these lobes on them. And lobes are quite common, especially on, on larger hailstones. Um, that's going to be problematic. So in the earlier slide, you saw that a lot of people observe or report photographs of hail from home or their cat holiday cabin. Um, and I think many people uh, have access to kitchen scales. So we can sidestep all the problems we saw in that previous page by just weighing the hailstone. And then you do have to make assumption about the density of the ice, but we have a pretty good handle on, on the density of ice in hailstones. And even if that is off by a bit, uh, it doesn't affect the, the final estimates of the diameter of the hail very much. And it's also very quick and easy to do. So right now I'm busy working with Coco Ross in, uh, in the States and in Canada to try and encourage uh, members of Coco Ross to 
um, if they observe hail to try and measure some of the larger stones and report the mass in, a, in addition to the diameter if they happen to measure it. And I have high hopes for that. It's going to take a little time to get some momentum, but I think once it does, uh, it's going to change uh, things a lot. So the other gap we have is in microphysical, my cloud microphysics and modeling. Um, we don't have a complete understanding of the microphysical processes. And uh, a lot of the models that we're using, even the sophisticated ones, are using outdated parameterization schemes. Um, hail fall, it sounds like a simple thing, but how hail falls is actually quite important when you're modeling it. Um, and we have some good hypotheses how it might happen, but to date, we've never actually been able to observe a hailstone fall um, and take all the measurements of all the different ranges of motion that are going on. And I'm working with some people now in which we hope we can finally uh, uh, speak to this and address it and write it up in a journal paper. But right now, it's still an unknown. Uh, how the partition, the, the cloud condensate in updrafts is partitioned between frozen water and liquid water is very important because that means it determines how much liquid water is available to grow the hailstone. And uh, here's again, uh, like that collection efficiency graphic I showed you, is the um, partitioning of cloud ice in, in a storm as a function of the temperature. So obviously the colder it gets, the higher percentage of uh, condensate is in the ice phase. But you can see, again, these are all papers from the scientific literature. Uh, there's a wide range of values there. So we need to try and constrain these better. And I showed you the collection efficiency of ice during dry growth earlier. And the other thing that's becoming, in, uh, we, 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 we are suspecting is quite important is the updraft volume uh, in determining the size and amount of hail that reaches the ground. And what are the environmental factors that control uh, the, the volume of the updraft? And then another important factor is, is how long does hail reside in what we call the hail growth zone? And this is an area of the cloud where you have both supercooled water and ice, and the hail is able to grow quite efficiently. And that's typically between about minus 10, minus 12, and about minus 35 in the updraft. And uh, we, we do have a pretty good idea of what trajectories hailstones follow in storms. Contrary to what we were told many years ago, you know, it's not this uh, image or something cycling repeatedly up and down in the updraft of the storm. Uh, stones usually tend to traverse the updraft in a simple up-down trajectory. Uh, but that's from work that was done in the 70s and 80s um, using uh, Doppler-derived uh, vertical motion and horizontal winds in thunderstorms and assuming that's static in time and then introducing, using those winds to drive a cloud model. We still haven't actually observed directly how these stones move. So some solutions is to go out there and collect data from cloud base to cloud top using instrumented aircraft like we have over here, this is a German aircraft that's instrumented with microphysical uh, sensors. Uh, continue vertical wind tunnel uh, experiments with mixed phase particles. Oftentimes people just use super cooled water droplets in wind tunnel experiments when they're looking at hail. They don't have a mixture of hail, uh, sorry, of ice and water as would be observed in the hail growth zone. This is the, the main, uh, one of the few tunnels that is available in the world to do hail research uh, in Germany, it's the University of Mainz. And we need carefully design numerical experiments using, for example, Cloud Model 1, the, the one that you saw that beautiful tornado being produced by, and other 3D cloud models. And then we need to also look at the impact of the environment and storm relative flow on updraft properties and the residence time of hail in the hail growth zone. Uh, Matt Kumjian has done some really good work uh, on this in recent years, looking at storm relative winds and how they might affect hail. And we need to improve. We have it, we need to improve the access to computational fluid dynamics. This is something that I think has been uh, quite underutilized in our field. Um, it's been around a while, and we're slowly starting to get there. Uh, this is a paper by Cheng et al. in 2014, looking at the flow around hailstones having different roughness and how that might affect the ventilation coefficient of, of, of the hailstones. And then, of course, nowadays machine learning is very it's it's very big. Um, and we need to see, find ways that we can use that machine learning to improve the microphysical schemes. And then we also have at our disposal now high-speed photography, 
up to a thousand frames per second to analyze the motion of 3D printed hailstones, for example. Uh, the third pillar or that needs to be uh, tackled is the identification of hail. Um, identifying hail and hail size with or without radar can be done. It's very tricky though. And uh, current operational techniques are obviously limited to, to areas where we have radar coverage. Um, Canada faces a very similar problem to that they do in Australia um, in that we have a big country uh, with a widely dispersed population and obviously it's really hard to cover that entire area. Well, it's very going to be very costly, inhibitively costly to cover everywhere with radar. So we have important decisions to make about where we put those radars. Uh, we still have limited ability to discriminate between hail size using radar. We can now determine with quite high level of confidence where there is a very high likelihood of hail, but we don't always know how big that hail is. Although Ortega has developed a hail size discrimination algorithm using dual polarization radar data. And we have few validation, validated operational tools to quantify the massive hail on ground. So the total kinetic energy of the hail fall. Um, you know, there's a difference between here where we have a few large hailstones that are widely dispersed versus this where we have a lot of small hail. Uh, the kinetic energy in, in these scenes could be the same. So they could result in the same damage. And these, what, what is worse, the small hail could clog uh, drains and need to localize flooding. And then, of course, we could get the kinetic energy that causes damage from a lot of large hailstones, which is probably the worst case scenario. Um, we can use satellite techniques. Uh, but unfortunately, they only tell you right now whether or not there's hail aloft in the storm. Um, another radar tool that's very useful is the maximum expected hail size or mesh, but this needs refining. And it was developed using observations where we have this nasty gap around about four centimeters. So just above that red dashed line there is your golf ball hail spike. And then below that you have a bit of a no man's land. And that's very problematic. But fortunately, Marillo and, and Homer have just released a paper where they've tried to address this problem and they've actually developed a new version of the mesh algorithm uh, based on a much better data set and applying some fancy statistics like dithering or statistical techniques. So some possible solutions to this third gap are we can now have CubeSats orbiting the planet and they relay data in near real time at very high spatial, and temp uh, spatial resolution too. Uh, we have the GPM mission data that's still up there uh, with the dual wavel wavelength space radar. It's got a KA and a KU band radar, and, and people are hard at work trying to use those data to try identify hail storms. And then we have a new generation of geostationary satellites. We've got the GO-16 and 17, the Himawari and Meteosat platforms. And uh, Chris Betka from NASA has done a lot of work on uh, identifying overshooting tops in thunderstorms and uh, relating that, those to the occurrence of severe weather and hail on the ground. And there is some thinking that we might be able to infer the size of the updrafts using this overshooting uh, top data, but we don't know for sure yet. We have to look in that in more detail. And then of course you have lightning data and light, lightning mapping arrays, and uh, we can try and use those data to infer the presence of hail as a proxy for hail. And probably best is to combine one or more of the above data sources with the storm environment data from numerical weather prediction models or reanalysis data. And this is what Chris Betka and colleagues did in uh, for over Australia recently and uh, identified uh, the hotspot over the Gold Coast of Australia using um, overshooting top data and environmental uh, storm conditions. And then we need to keep developing uh, conventional radar and dual polarization radar metrics. So I'm just going to speak very quickly here to, uh, to MESH, some work I've been doing with uh, maximum expected size of hail. And uh, MESH does have a lot of potential, but of course, like any uh, tool, you need to determine its um, viability and its robustness uh, before applying it. But if we find that, that MESH is useful, uh, we could use it as a proxy for hail reports. And this would allow us to have high spatial temporal resolution and accurate information on the location and size of hail in near real time, uh, wherever you have radar coverage. 
So using those same uh, multi, uh, social media sourced hail reports, um, I undertook a process where I first identified the size of the hail as best as I could, as I, you can see in the top left here, for a particular storm. And then using some very strict control criteria, um, basically what I did is I used the mesh value the largest mesh value within a 10 kilometer radius of the report. Now that might sound like a large radius, um, and it is, but you've got to remember the Canadian radar scan every 10 minutes and the storm motion, the storms translating. Uh, so there's uncertainty also in the location of the storm report. We don't know for sure exactly where the report was made always. Uh, and the other interesting thing is that sometimes uh, the storm circulation itself can physically sling hailstones out of the storm. There was one storm north of Calgary, uh, I think it was in 2015, where it, it tracked just east of Airdrie, but hail was actually being reported well outside the reflectivity core and radar over northeast Calgary, about 12, 13 kilometers from the storm core. And when, when you look at these mesh data, on the left, and I think this is something important to keep in mind, hail uh, tends to follow an exponential distribution. So many small hailstones and obviously dropping off to uh, a few large hailstones. And note the log scale on the left-hand side of this image here. And the fact that the mesh data, albeit from radar, uh, mimic this hail size distribution is very encouraging. And then when we compare the the size of the hail estimated from the mesh product against the uh, high quality observations and quality control observations that I made, uh, you get a pretty high correlation coefficient. Um, there are biases, um, but it's pretty encouraging. Uh, and this is for the Canadian C-band radars on the prairies for those data from 2014 through 2016. So since then, um, encouraged by those data, I looked at uh, three years so far, but I'm going to add another two years for five years in total. Uh, these are the number of counts per bin. Each bin here, or a little hex hexagon, is about a thousand square kilometers in area. Uh, if you take the raw data from the radar, there are a lot of artifacts in it, especially uh, spurious um, uh, returns, this ground clutter, and obviously near the Rockies, you get a lot of clutter from the mountains, which the uh, storm tracking algorithm falsely identifies as a storm. So after applying a lot of quality control, you get the image on the bottom left, and you can see uh, near Calgary, uh, which is over here on the bottom left, uh, whereas before the highest counts of hail occurrence were over here, uh, or, or rather the number of cells tracked by the radar over here, it moves eastwards away to, over to the foothills. And you can actually see this indications of a lot of cells being tracked by the radar of a hail alley here. But then we have artifacts like here where this Bethune radar is uh, what we would say meteorology very cool. Um, and that's because it's not very sensitive. So it, it, it's, and it's, a, it's a systematic problem. So that's something you have to keep in mind with radars, and especially our current network, they're not all the same technology in terms of hardware and software, and this does uh, affect the data. So keeping all those limitations in mind, uh, if, if I had been the severe hail reports for those three years using the same technique, uh, you can see Hail Alley. Uh, you can also see Edmonton. You can also see Red Deer. You can also see Calgary and Winnipeg. So these are these hot spots because that's where people reside. So that's one of those biases I was referring to earlier. Uh, for all we know, there's a lot of hail up here, for example, near Cold Lake, but there's nobody there to report it, so it goes unnoticed. But if you look at the radar data, you see a very similar pattern reflected uh, over the foothills of, of Alberta, high incidence of severe hail. They found in research that a, a limit of three centimeter diameter in the mesh product is usually related to severe hail size on the ground. So it tends to measure a bit high, but multiple studies have found this three uh, centimeter uh, threshold for severe hail. So that's what I've applied here. And then you can see the Bethune radar, there's very little hail reported by the radar, but that's because the radar is too cool and underestimating the strength of the storms. And then there also seems to be a bit of a hot spot here of a southwestern Saskatchewan and southwestern Manitoba. So the fourth gap, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, is that there's been a stagnation in lab experiments. 
and gathering in situ cloud data for a long time now. Uh, there was some very ingenious work carried out in the 50s and 80s um, by people like Macklin and Les, uh, List and uh, people like that. Uh, but since the 90s, there's been very little uh, wind tunnel work done. And uh, I think we need to get going on that again um, using more sophisticated uh, wind tunnels. So some solutions are we need an aircraft. We used to have an aircraft called the T-28 that they used to penetrate hailstorms with. They'd fly right into the hail core aloft uh, with this instrumented aircraft. And we got a lot of good data from that. But that, that was a long time ago. That was decades ago now. So we're thinking about a replacement and uh, this uh, with the Thunderbolt aircraft, but that requires money. And it's going to be a long time before we have another instrumented aircraft, even if they do get the funding, because they have to convert it. Um, we can study hail growth using a uh, vertical icing tunnel with a mixture of super cool droplets and ice crystals. We can embrace unconventional thinking. Uh, alternatives to ice tunnels do exist. I don't know if you've ever heard of iFly World, where you can go skydiving indoors. Well, that's basically just a giant wind tunnel. Uh, the winds in these uh, uh, wind tunnels are up to 55 meters per second, which could support a Vivian-sized hailstone. And we could study the full behavior of natural and instrumented 3D printed stones. And <clears throat> we may even be able to develop something called a hail pod, which looks similar to this device. And I'm actually working with somebody now on doing this, uh, in which we hope to release these into storms and actually get four dimensional data, from, uh, including measurements on the actual uh, movement of the, you know, if it's rotating and gyrating um, through the storm. So I just want to speak very quickly to the dual polarization radar network. Uh, I think this is a very interesting, great tool that we're going to be getting in Canada. Uh, we've already got five radars installed. Uh, dual polarization, as the name suggests, traditional radars transmit the energy in a horizontal or vertical plane only. Here we transmit data in a vertical and horizontal plane. And uh, that allows us to identify the shape of the, of the uh, reflect or the scattering object. And that in turn allows us to determine whether or not it's rain, hill, or snow. So dual polarizations are really good for that. Uh, we're using S-band radars instead of C-bands. Uh, S-bands are a lot more powerful and less susceptible to attenuation. And they're also superior for observing large hydrometeors and allows us, like I just said, to classify the, the type of precipitation, which is very useful and important for forecasters. Um, this new radar network, all the hardware and software are going to be the same. Right now, we've got a bit of a, a potpourri of, of, of the systems out there, which, like that Bethune radar, it causes us problems. And we'll have data every six minutes now in, uh, using a new scattering strategy instead of every 10 minutes previously. A lot can happen in 10 minutes when you're looking at severe weather and severe thunderstorms. And we'll have better coverage too. So this is our, our network. And uh, we're going to be getting a couple of new radars. One is the Lower Athabasca. We're going to be moving some radars like Jimmy Lake near Cold Lake and on Vancouver Island. They're going to be uh, look, they're looking for a new site there for the radar. And uh, over Quebec, La Castor, they're also looking at moving that radar. So it takes about 13 weeks for the company to install the, the radars once they're on site. Uh, we've got five installed to date. We're going to have 20 installed by the end of the project, but 33 if we exercise all our options. And uh, it started off pretty slowly, but not, from this year onwards, they're going to be installing seven radars per year across the country, including relocations. And all the radars should be installed late 2022 or 2023. And uh, these are the installs that are going in this year. So that Bethune radar is going to be replaced with a much superior radar uh, the summer, and uh, they're also going to start working on the Strathmore radar near Calgary uh, later in the summer. So just some specs on the new radars. These are much more powerful radars than what we have now. Um, they're one megawatt, and they don't tell the Americans, but it, they're a lot more powerful than their radars even. These are four times more powerful than existing radars. Uh, they have Klystron transmitters, which are much more stable than the old magnetrons. We have a pretty narrow wing width at about 0.9 degrees. The one sacrifice you do make with, with this, the S-bands is they're a little less sensitive. Um, 
than the C band. So this is a, a problem for, for detecting snow. They, they don't detect it as well as a C band would. And uh, to pull all this off, the new dishes are over nine meters in diameter. The existing dishes are, I think, four meters. Um, so it, it's a, the radomes are much bigger. And we're now going to benefit from a Doppler range extending out to 250 kilometers, whereas now we only have a Doppler range out to about 115, 120 kilometers. So just to wrap things up here, here presents a significant and costly uh, threat to society. Um, all aspects of hail science, monitoring and prediction are difficult. It, it's just the way it is. Um, and it's not aided by the fact that hail is a complex and multifaceted natural hazard. But we have, I think, entered a new era of hail research where we have new technologies, opportunities such as social media and instrumentation that are available that we didn't have before. And our scientific Understanding has continued to advance, albeit incrementally, but after not being the most popular research topic on the block for quite a while, there are indications now that hail is making a comeback and um, becoming getting more um, interest shown by, by, by researchers and funding agencies. So what we need next is a, a huge infusion of long-term funding. We need the security uh, to be able to conduct long-term projects using the best instrumentation and, and tools at our disposal. A lot of the funding in recent decades has gone to tornado research. We're hoping that either industry or government or both would, uh, you know, make the funds available that we can uh, collaborate and do some really good science. Uh, for example, a multi-season uh, field program um, somewhere over the Great Plains or, uh, or, uh, or maybe even the foothills of Alberta. And there's still much exciting science to be done. So <clears throat> I'm just going to speak now to a paper that we got published in uh, Nature Climate Change uh, last year, in which we looked at the health, changing health threat over North America in response to anthropogenic climate change. And I did this work in conjunction with my colleague, Dr. William Burroughs uh, from Science and Technology Branch in Environment Climate Change Canada and Dr. John Hanasek at the University of Manitoba. So as we know, hail is a costly and vexing problem and anthropogenic climate change is predicted to increase the number of severe storm environments. There's a uh, pretty high confidence in that based on numerous studies that have been conducted to date. The problem is, is that we have a low confidence and a lot of uncertainty surrounding how future hailstorms will respond to ACC. And this uncertainty stems from the limited number of studies, the empirical nature of these studies, and sometimes the conflicting results from the limited research that has been taken, undertaken. So how hail frequency and size might respond to ACC is, is important, and uh, we need to try and address some of these limitations to reduce our risk. Um, some of these things we do have control over, like exposure, uh, the hazard you can't really do much about, but you can also decrease your vulnerability, but that takes understanding of how things are going to change in the future so you can plan for it. So previous work, the research was uh, based primarily on the response to severe storms um, <clears throat> to global warming uh, using the, what we call the CAPE bulk wind difference phase space. Like I mentioned earlier, basically as your CAPE increases, uh, that increases the buoyancy and the strength of the updrafts that are required to support heavy hydrometers like hail, but the bulk wind difference or the vertical wind shear helps organize your storms um, and also creates favorable environments for tornadoes, for example. <clears throat> so here is uh, some information from Diffenbauer et al. in a paper that was published in 2013. And in this paper, they used uh, an empirical relationship derived for the current climate between atmospheric parameters and damaging uh, hail days. And they applied it to the, you can apply it to the future. Uh, in this case, they were looking at just severe thunderstorm environments. They weren't looking at hail specifically, but the assumption is, is that whatever relationships you derive now, whether it be for severe storms or for hail, also apply in the future, which is not necessarily true. So we saw an opportunity here to, to try and contribute something. And we looked at the North American Regional Climate Change Assessment Program, where we looked at uh, data from three um, regional climate models that were driven by global climate models uh, over North America. And 
there we used the hail cost model to explicitly model the, the size of hail and the response of that hail to the <clears throat> sorry the, the the new environments of the global warming so the, although there were many more members and pairings available for this particular uh, project norcap we did a lot of quality control and background checks to find those model pairings that gave us the most reliable data to, to drive hail cost with so we looked at two windows one was what we'll call the current climate or well, that's arguably not true anymore uh, which is 71 through 2000 and then a future window of 30 years starting in 2041 so these data were available on a 50 kilometer grid it's about 5,000 data points over north america and in total we generated about a billion profiles we didn't run the hail model of all of those billion profiles but a lot of them and we looked at a period between the 1st of March and the 30th of September. <clears throat> and then we identified the largest hailstone for each day from hail cast at each of those grid points. And then we aggregated the exceedances in this, and exceedance here is if the higher hail size exceeded two centimeters, which is used as the threshold for severe hail in Canada. And we did this by month season and year for each of the 15 ecoregions. So here is the current hail climate uh, using NIS um, regional climate model data and hail cost. So on the left we have the number of cumulative number of days in March, April, May, the accumulated kinetic energy, <clears throat> which is a function of the number of hail days and the diameter of hail on those hail days. So if you have more hail days with more large hail, you'll have a higher kinetic energy. So it's, a, it's an indicator of what the damage potential um, for a particular area. And then we have the number of days with hail aloft only. We call these hail or halo days. So basically this is hail that was aloft. It was at least a centimeter in diameter, but it melted before reaching the surface. So this is how the climatology looks in the spring. You can see Southern Great Plains is quite active, especially for AKE. Then in the summer, and you can see in the summertime of the southeast US, melted hail is actually a really important part of the hydrological cycle um, in terms of pr producing rain. Now, the problem here is, as you can see, is, is that the, the, these data, although they do identify hail alley here near Calgary and Edmonton, they were pushing the severe hail way too deep into the mountainous terrain of the southern Rockies over the states. And we think this is because of the course model spacing there was seepage of moisture into the higher terrain, <clears throat> but we're not sure about that. But the, it does move slightly. If you look here uh, for the May through September period, uh, your area of highest hail threat does shift eastwards to the, to the Great Plains of the US. And then we have this nice bullseye here over um, Hail Alley over Western Canada. So these, these results are quite encouraging. So after we looked at this, we decided, well, how are things gonna change in the future? Now we're dealing with a, a rare event that is highly variable in space and time, both intra-annually and interannually. So teasing out a statistically robust signal is, is, was quite tricky. But before looking at that, I just want to give you an idea of all the processes involved in making hail and <clears throat> why it's complicated that you can't just see off the top of your head how hail is going to respond. Uh, for, for hail to form, you need meso, favorable meso and synoptic scale uh, environment, which is instability for the updrafts. Those are fed by moisture. You need moisture. Instability alone is not enough. And then you don't need a limited amount of instability. You need a lot of instability as quantified by K. And then you also need a lot of uh, vertical wind shear and what we call low convective inhibition. So you don't need, <clears throat> you need an environment where storms can be easily triggered, but then you still need a trigger mechanism. And then you can get hail. If all those things fall into place but that's just the mesosynoptic scale at the macro and micro scale you also need a sufficiently strong updraft high liquid water content in the updraft hail embryos that can form the building blocks for the hail <clears throat> sufficient growth time of hail in the updraft a large updraft which will maximize the hail residence time favorable storm relative winds and then large hail so there are a lot of processes at work here and it's not always clear <clears throat> a priori how these are all going to interact and affect hail. 
For example, <clears throat> in the future, it's going to be warmer, so it'll probably increase the instability, but that can also increase the convective inhibition. So you might have fewer but stronger storms. And higher temperatures are also going to increase the melting potential, which is important for uh, melting small hail especially. The signal in terms of the bulk wind difference of vertical wind shear is not as clear, <clears throat> especially how it pertains to hail. And changes in the trigger triggers for hail storms or for thunderstorms in general are very difficult to do, especially at 50 kilometers. So you have to keep that in mind too uh, when you're looking at these results. So future changes, and this is here for days with one centimeter larger hail in the spring, and then moving into the summer and for the entire year. You can see here, there's expected to be an increased number of hail storms over Western Alberta, but very little clear signal elsewhere over Canada, but a very strong decline in the number of hail days over the Southeastern United States. For severe uh, thunderstorm days, this is the spring, the summer, and then for the entire year. So it's a very similar picture to days with more than one centimeter hail, um, but the, the, the amount of, the signal's not as strong over the southeast United States. And again, very weak signal over most of Canada, apart from Alberta and British Columbia. And this is the maximum size of hail. So in the spring, even in the southeast, where there are fewer hail days, the hail is likely to be larger, especially over the Great Plains in the spring. And in the summer, that retreats to the high ground of the Rockies and again, uh, Alberta. Um, but there's a decline in the hail size over the southeast uh, over the course of the year, as you can see here. And then in terms of the accumulated kinetic energy, uh, in the spring, uh, looks to be quite a robust increase over the plains of the United States. That moves <clears throat> northwestwards during the summer months with a hot spot over Alberta and uh, over uh, Wyoming. And then over the entire season, um, the, the signal gets a bit diluted again. So just to summarize, uh, this is the first study to explicitly model the response of hail to, to warming without using any empirical approach, but actually explicitly modeling the hail size using microphysics in, in, a, in a cloud and hail model. Um, there's a concept, complex interplay of drivers and processes uh, that were taken care of during this, this, this study. And the response of hail over North America to ACC varies a lot by region and by season, and also in terms of the strength of the response. But in general, fewer hail days are expected in the future over most areas, but uh, and a marked decrease in hail damage potential over the east and southeast portions of the United States or North America. But we are expecting an increase in the hail diameter on days when it does hail in the future. And the result is that there's greater hail damage potential over most areas in March, April, and May, especially over the Southern Great Plains. And then the higher latitudes, including Alberta and Hill Alley, and the mountainous areas in June, July, and August. But we still need to do more work. This is just one set of model runs um, or, or parent models. Um, we need to use more data and expand the study globally. And uh, one data set we could use is the Cordex data. And we can also, instead of using hail cost, we could try and use uh, convection relying models or climate uh, CM1 or uh, wharf hail cost uh, that was recently developed by um, <clears throat> Becky Adam Sellen and Conrad Ziegler. And that is the end. Uh, thank you. My voice was running out there. Sorry about that. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please pass them along to Dan, and I'll be happy to answer them as best I can. Excellent. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Even though your voice is uh, fading, uh, it sounded good uh, throughout. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Very, very, very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, so we have a number of questions from folks uh, on the line. Uh, we've got over 50 people. Uh, if you do have some questions, please go ahead and, and submit them. Um, so first, first off, I think there's a fair bit of interest in the in um, I think assisting uh, you and and uh, your group with uh, hail observations. And you mentioned uh, earlier on that uh, you're preparing some public information material 
on how to uh, report um, hail uh, in sort of a more uh, accurate way. Um, and there's some interest here from some of the attendees on, I think, attaining and distributing this information. Um, so is there, do you, do you have a plan in terms of pushing out that public information and, and what do you think, uh, what can we do, what can our insurance members do to, to help with that? Um, yeah, we're happy to share that. Um, it's been a bit of slow progress because we don't have many in-house resources to create, um, uh, you know, nice looking inf infographics. Um, but uh, one, what we have right now are just mockups, but I, I don't see why not if in the future, once they're completed, that uh, we, I'm sure it won't be a problem to share them with whoever's interested. And we'd be more than happy for people to, to you know, spread the word. Um, like I said earlier, it's a public uh, education exercise. And uh, the more uh, people we have out there um, pushing uh, the message, the better. So it, 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 it's nice to hear that people are interested in, in helping in that regard. Right, sure. And I think uh, with the, the networks um, that uh, that some of our members have, um, even getting their own employees and uh, insurance <coughs> brokers and, and so on on board and, and informed about how to collect this data that uh, might uh, result in, in some good reporting, and especially in the Alberta area. Uh, additional question. Um, so you mentioned, um, I think near the end of your your presentation, you mentioned briefly that uh, the the threshold for severe hail is uh, scenarios where the hail uh, stones are over two centimeters in size. And I'm wondering if uh, if you're interested in observations or people reporting via social media. Uh, are you interested in all events, including you know more minor uh, hail events of smaller stones? Um, so should we be reporting on all events that we experience, or just focus on the more severe events? Uh, that's a very good question and a very good point. Um, what I found doing research is that uh, null reports are very important. They're also incredibly hard to come by because obviously people are very interested. I, what I found is that people tend to report uh, small hail far less frequently. And if they do report small hail, it's usually out the window, you know, so it's very subjective to try and get an idea of the size. And, and that's not surprising. I mean, uh, there's no reason why people would expect that these small hailstones would be important. But when we're developing algorithms to differentiate between small hail and large hail, or small hail and no hail, because enough small hail can be just as problematic. There's, there's, there's quite a bit of research now going on to try and determine how much ice the storm is going to produce uh, in terms of the mass rather than focusing just on the size. So it's, the short answer to your question is yes, definitely. Um, small hail is actually very important. And you know, even if it's a, if it's a heck of a thunderstorm and there's a downpour and there's no hail in that, that's just as valuable. Um, that, the, the, the fact that there's no hail in that particular storm. Because radar could be telling us there is hail in that storm, and uh, that may not be the case on the ground. Okay, <laughs> we'll try to mobilize our network here, but uh, be prepared for an uh, inundation of uh, of reports. <laughs> um, oh, okay. That's good. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so, some other uh, and maybe more basic questions for you. Some practical questions, uh, but questions I have as well. Uh, so you mentioned several times the 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 hail corridor in in Alberta, sort of between Edmonton and Calgary. Um, so a couple of questions: Why why is this area such a hot spot, and uh, why say, for example, uh, do we not get uh, hailstorms in the west coast? Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, to be honest, nobody's actually studied exactly why it, it it is such a hot spot. That, that's on my very long to-do list. I mean, we have we, we, we know why the, the we know that the ingredients are there, but why everything comes um, into sync there is, is maybe a more subtle question. Um, really, what what we have the, the Rocky Mountains play a very important role um, in, in setting the scene um, because what will happen is is we get what we call an upslope flow, an easterly flow 
of moisture from the, the plains, even as far uh, as the US Northern Plains. And this basically under the right synoptic conditions, you'll get a pooling of moisture along the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Um, then above that, oftentimes you'll have the jet stream, um, you know, higher, higher up. So th this, you have this easterly low level flow bringing in the moisture. And above that, you have a very strong jet stream if the situation's right. Uh, and that creates the ideal conditions for lots of vertical wind shear. And the moisture creates the, the setting for um, feeding the updrafts. Now, the other aspect of that is it's the warm season. So um, you, you're getting fairly strong lapse rates, so fairly strong decrease in temperature with height because of the strong heating in the low levels of the atmosphere and cooling aloft. So all those things together tend to make um, that, that area very favorable, that higher terrain favorable for, for the uh, triggering and, and incidence of hailstorms. On your west coast, for example, um, because of the, the, the moderating effect of the ocean, you typically don't get as warm temperatures in the low levels. So you get much weaker uh, lapse rates, which works or negate, like it works against uh, building up a lot of buoyancy to support really strong updraft. You may well have the strong wind shear, but you also do need those strong updrafts. And then it, it, it's, it's hard to get uh, a focus where you can trigger the thunderstorms. Uh, over the foothills, we get something we call the dry line, where you have, which is a boundary between very dry air over the mountain peaks of the Rockies and the more moist air over the foothills and the plains. And that can be a focus for triggering thunderstorms during the summer months. Um, over areas like the West Coast, for example, that, that because of the complex terrain, um, that's also you know, if the possible factor that's missing. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, no, that's very, very uh, good information. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting topic. <coughs> and we'll continue to, to follow that topic and, and would be interested in learning more. Um, so during your discussion about the, the new radars, uh, the dual polarization radar station, there was a question from an attendee, Jared, um, asking how to access, uh, I suppose, access data from these, these radars. Uh, is data going to be made uh, publicly available and, and how might people access the data? Okay, um, I know if I'm the best person to ask about that. Um, I think my, I do stand to be corrected on this, so I hope I don't get it wrong. My, my understanding is now that the data are available, um, at least a, a basic data, because I, I do know that other groups do display data from Environment Canada radars. Um, <clears throat> and but if people want specifics on how to go to where to, to actually physically grab those data in real time, I, I, if I could, I'm happy to point them in the right direction. Um, with the dual pole radars, um, the rollout is going to be quite slow. And because the thing with dual pole radars is there's a lot more information coming from each volume scan. Um, uh, it's not just twice as much information. It's it a lot more than that. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, is that when we get for us to get to the point where we can share uh, those dual polarization variables, uh, such as ZDR uh, and things like that, it's, it's going to take a while to uh, where we have the, the good latency and ability to share those data in real time. But I do think it's going to, it's, it is coming. It's just going to, okay. people are going to have to be patient. Right. Good to know. Uh, but it sounds like it'll be uh, pretty useful when it's uh, up and running. Um, Definitely. So there's, there are a couple questions here about hail suppression. Um, so this is an insurance audience uh, and uh, might be probably familiar with some of that hail suppression work that's been going on. Uh, so I'd be interested in, in hearing your thoughts about about the, that topic generally, um, and then there's a very a more specific question: um, How does the hail suppression program affect uh, research and predictions of uh, concerning hail? Right. Okay. Um, that's a difficult one, and and as you can imagine, it's also quite contentious. Um, nature is not our friend in this regard because. We, it's the, in some respects, it is a good laboratory, and in other respects, it's a terrible laboratory. And where I'm going with this is that 
we don't with with seeding specifically of to either to make rain or to enhance rain uh, or to mitigate hail formation in storms it's very hard to have a control storm um, even if you have two storms that are on the same day in close proximity to each other um, they can still behave very differently because of you know factors like outflow boundaries that could affect how they develop and form um, so there has been research done on this and and this is my own personal professional take on this is that I, I don't think there's compelling evidence that one can systematically make a difference um, I, just because of that control problem right um, it's just it's going to be very hard to tease out a conclusive robust statistical signal and then make it repeatable um, because of all the, the, the conflating things that are and, and, and th the complexity of the system. So whether or not it makes a difference, I, I would say is still open up to debate. Um, I mean, there's okay. even some research now where they've been using cloud models that suggest that seeding storms in certain conditions may increase the likelihood of hail. And that's not to say it's going to happen every time, um, that, and that's in a model environment uh, under certain conditions. So whether or not that is actually happening in nature is another question. Okay, sorry, I've forgotten getting... what the, the second part was. Oh, I, well, like, I think it's, uh, you sort of answered. <laughs> um, okay. It was um, uh, um, sort of, I guess, an assumption if it, if it is working, uh, does it affect uh, uh, research and, and predictions? Oh. But I, I, <laughs> uh, you know, it would be very hard. Um, if, if, if I was doing research, I would probably look, uh, if, if the data, if the meta information were available, I'd probably focus on unseeded storms, um, just because there is a chance there that it is having an impact, and we don't necessarily know how that impact is going to manifest itself. Uh, right. As for forecasters, I, I don't think they worry too much about whether or not a storm is being seeded or not. Um, but I don't work on the forecast desk, but that would be my my gut feeling on that. Right. Okay. Um, so some questions about, uh, so you mentioned, well, the, the discouraging, I suppose, um, erosion of our observation networks in, in Canada, uh, you know, concerning hail. Um, and, but you at the same time identified some newer technologies um that might uh, be able to be deployed at, at relatively low cost um and, and curious about your thoughts um about sort of setting up private networks so there's you know apps like uh, the weather underground that use um uh you know sort of household weather monitoring stations um is there any potential to integrate these types of technologies in, into these uh, you know, private monitoring networks, and would that be helpful, or is it something that really needs to be coordinated uh, at the national level by, uh, you know, by even Canada? Um, I don't think it needs to be coordinated by an agency like Environment Climate Change Canada. Um, I mean, I'm familiar with Wonderground. I actually post my weather data there from my the station in my backyard. It, it's been a, a, a really good uh, a program that they've undertaken there with the, the private weather stations. And I think what would have to be controlled is, is the hardware and software. Uh, when you have a gastrometer, there's some pretty fancy uh, signal monitoring that you have, uh, processing that you have to do to tease out the, the information. And they do need calibrating. So uh, ideally, it would be a single sourced or uh, uh, somebody, you know, that there has to be some control over it. But I, I, I don't know. I, I assume people, and, and, and they're not, I mean, they're not, terribly expensive. Um, you could probably build one for a couple of hundred dollars uh, if you know, you're willing to do uh, the, the, the work yourself. But if there's this also scale, right? Like if there are a lot of them being built, that the cost would come down immensely. And I think people would be very, uh, at least some people who are interested in thunderstorms would be very interested in having um, the stromatists in their backyard or on their farm or wherever they are. So I think the potential there is is is, is huge, and, and it would be very beneficial because it would be objective, it wouldn't be subjective, and you, we could potentially get the data in real time. So I would be very much in favor of that, yes. 
Great. Okay, good to know. Um, so we have a question here from uh, uh, Keg Das, um, and I'm thinking uh, this participant is an expert in this topic, so I'm going to read his question out, so bear, bear with me. Uh, you mentioned an exponential distribution for hail. However, in my experience, you don't tend to see huge numbers of small stones, but instead a number of stones around the same size with larger stones inter uh, interspersed. I realize that some of this might be due to melting, but how accurate do you really think an exponential distribution assumption is? Um, <laughs> he does have a point. Um, well, the, you can use other distributions too. Just, just for, for the audience today, I, I was trying to keep it simple, but you, you could use a gamma distribution. Um, and if you look at a gamma distribution, it actually peaks away from the small sizes it, uh, and then tapers off again. So uh, a lot of people um, in, in a microphysics scheme uh, would tend to, I think, lean towards using a gamma distribution. Um, but you're right, it, it doesn't necessarily uh, behave that way, although we do know from hail pad studies in, um, in Europe, where they have many hail pads for quite a long period now, that, that uh, for example, a gamma distribution does explain that occurrence of hail quite well. Now, that's over a long period over many hail pads. In a particular storm, that's when it gets very tricky because in a particular storm, you could have nearly all the hail is very small, and that's most definitely not an exponential distribution or a gamma distribution, uh, or you could have a mixture. So if you're talking at an event basis, yes, I definitely agree with him. But I think if you're looking at uh, integrated data over longer periods, and we know this from hail pads, then uh, an exponential norm or maybe more preferably a gamma distribution would be more appropriate. Okay, very, very good. Um, so we have a number of additional questions and I think we'll, we'll have to have to come up here. Um, so hopefully, um, with remaining questions uh, could uh, contact you. I'm not sure if you have contact info here, uh, but if not, uh, maybe they can forward the questions to uh, through ICLR and we can send them on to you because um, mm -hmm. there are a number of additional ones. Um, and I suppose I'll, I'll end by, uh, by, I suppose, saying that uh, if there is opportunities for us or our membership or our network to help with the collection of data, I think people would be excited to participate. Um, you know, I think well, well informed people with uh, their camera phones and, and so on uh, would be eager to collect uh, data where they can and, and send it in. So hopefully we can we can help uh, help you guys out with that. Um, and uh, before we sign off, just any any last uh, any last thoughts? Uh, well, first of all, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity, Dan. I uh, really appreciate it. And it was nice encouraging to see a high attendance rate today. Um, if people do have questions for me, I, I'm sorry, that was my my mistake. I should have put my email address up there, but it's julian.brimelow, B-R-I-M as in mother, E-L-O-W, at canada.ca. That's my official government address. And yeah, if people still have questions or want to share thoughts or anything with me, uh, this is kind of a passion of mine, so I'm always very happy to talk about it and uh, happy to answer to the best of my ability uh, any questions people might have. But uh, like I said, thanks again for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Great, well, thanks for the excellent talk. Uh, I, I certainly learned uh, quite a bit and, um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll continue to follow, follow your work and maybe see some more presentations in the future. So thanks again for your time. Um, and thanks everyone for joining and thanks for all the, the great questions. Um, our next uh, Friday forum will be um, uh, later in April. We'll have um, a talk on uh, wildland fire modeling from third-party model, uh, third modeling group. Uh, watch your, your inbox for some more details on that in the, in the coming weeks. Um, so thanks again, uh, Dr. Brimelow. Thanks for the attendees. And uh, with that, uh, the webinar is concluded. Thank you.